Hello! You're watching the Great Canadian Bagel here, and we have today another Canada federal election forecast update. Now, with no further ado, I'd like to once again shout out my channel members. I really appreciate the support you guys give the channel, and without you, this would not really be as possible as it would be otherwise. And if you guys want to support the channel, by all means, go down in the link in the description below and press the join button. Otherwise, do your regular YouTube things. Like, share, subscribe, and comment below. With no further ado, let us begin. So, the I've mentioned this in previous federal updates for Canada, but <clears throat> we have kind of entered into a, uh, what's the word for it? A new status quo. Now, what that means is the polls that are coming out and the changes that are happening are not really shaking up the political landscape that much. What you're seeing is the margin of error and noise from polling. Sometimes we'll change something over here, sometimes change something over there. But the overall movement is pretty small. There's been some inklings, perhaps, just maybe, that there's something moving in Quebec. You can kind of see here that, like, the last few updates, like... Maybe the Conservatives are up a little bit. Maybe the Liberals are down. But it's so small that you can't really say anything concrete. And this is really the same case across the board. There is some movements happening, but at the same token, it really does just seem to be hovering around 27 Liberal, 42 Conservative, 17 NDP, 3 Green, 7-7, seven, seven, Block... 1.8 PPC. Everything just seems to be bouncing around those numbers. The provincial numbers themselves have also settled down into what appears to be a pretty static circumstance. In fact, the only area that has any, had any movement since the summer is Atlantic Canada, or like any relevant movement. But even then, the July 1st number is still higher than the today's number, which tells you that things are really just moving around. That is for the Conservatives. Now, I say that, and prior the day before this video was released, there was a really good poll for the Conservatives in Atlantic Canada from Ledger. Ledger had them at a 55 to 20, or sorry, to 19 for the Liberals. Pretty strong performance. Numbers like that would imply everything but Bathurst here would flip. Yes, even all Halifax and St. John's would flip. That said, I don't think that is necessarily the actual state of the race. Because this poll also had the PPC at 9% in Atlantic Canada. And I can tell you as a Nova Scotian, that's just not happening. You're not going to see the PPC getting a high enough vote share in Nova Scotia to get anywhere close to 9%. So what's likely, and keep in mind, this isn't like you're being a bad pollster. It's just on a sample size of 88 people, the margin of error is approximately 11%. So this likely fictitious 9% PPC support is literally within margin of error of negative 2. <laughs> Give you an idea of how... You can discredit that a little bit. So in reality, the Liberals and the NDP and stuff are probably a little higher in this poll than they would otherwise be. And we kind of get... And when you average them out the other polls, you kind of get where we are right now. Again, it keeps coming back here. Now, you might think to yourself, well, surely different issues are popping up, like immigration is becoming a really big issue right now, really getting more head... Or, like, other things happening. Maybe the economy is getting better. Apparently the numbers right now are suggesting that uh, real wages are increasing again. And by that I mean they're, like, no longer... Uh, how do I want to phrase this? The real wages apparently have hit their new all-time high again. So they rebounded from the lull post-COVID. I haven't really looked into those numbers myself, so I'm just going off what I read, and it was not necessarily the best source, but we're going to say that happened. So you might be thinking, like, okay, some things are good for the Liberals here, some things might be bad for the Liberals here, so what's going on? Nothing's going on. 
Because the thing you need to understand about political coalitions on a grand national scale is their coalitions. There isn't this fictitious world where every single voter is a complete atomic individual who votes completely special. Voters form coherent blocks, and these blocks mostly vote homogeneously. For example, oil workers overwhelmingly vote conservative. I don't have the exact numbers, but I believe it's somewhere in the realm of like 70% or something like that vote conservative. It's overwhelming. Conversely, you have, like, say, public sector union workers, and they vote pretty liberal, pretty NDP. And there's all these other brackets and boxes, too. It really breaks down into a lot. When you're talking about a country like Canada with, like, what, 42 million people, you have a lot of different baskets. Even some groups that you might think otherwise might be similar, such as Atlantic Canada fishermen and BC fishermen, are different because Atlantic Canada and BC are different areas. They're different regions of the country. <clears throat> now, there's some similarities there, but they're not the same. And even inside Atlantic Canada, the Newfoundland fishermen and the lobster fishermen in southern Nova Scotia is probably not that similar. They're more similar than they're different, but they're not the same. So what you see here is kind of the distillation of political hierarchies. Now, I can't tell you the structuring and ordering of this. You'd have to do a really detailed, really in-depth analysis, what I do not have the funding or time to do. But let's take the fisherman example. So you have the overall box of all fishermen in the country. Then you might have the Newfoundland fishermen as one subcategory. The Nova Scotian lobster fisheries as another category. The BC salmon fisheries as another. The fish farmers as another. And etc. You could, you could make this as complicated as you want. And there might be even subgroups. There might be Nova Scotian fishermen. And then it could be broken into Nova Scotian fish farmers and Nova Scotian lobster fishermen or Nova Scotian regular fishermen, etc. You, you can you see that point, right? You can break this down as complicated as you want to, but there is this hierarchical structure. And how coalition forming works on a societal scale is you get branches of these hierarchy structures supporting you. It might be the entire branch of fishermen. It might just be the Nova Scotian lobster fishermen. It might just be the Newfoundland fishermen or whatever. But you get these branches of these hierarchy trees supporting you. And that causes big movement. And that's why it can lag. Why polling changes take a few months to go through. Because it takes a while for this whole group of people to agree on what they're wanting to do. Because this isn't a situation where there's like a meeting where they get all the oil workers in Alberta together and they're like, okay, this is who we're voting for. No, that's not how it works. It's that the underlying effects and trends and policies that affect the Albertan oil workers take a while to propagate through the population for them to all be aware of it, for them to be aware of the op options and who the opportunities are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It takes time to propagate through. No change of policy. For example, let's say federal government. If Trudeau today, right now, went on a press conference and said he is going to get rid of or fast track every single oil project in the entire country, and then actually does that, it would not switch the oil workers overnight because there's some trust issues. It takes a while for them to actually be aware this is happening and for them to believe it is happening. But eventually, it will transition such that the, he will do significantly better with oil workers. And you could set this with any other identifiable group of people. And... All professions are not necessarily identifiable groups of people. I've picked oil workers and fishermen in particular because oil is so politicized 
and fishermen because they form a very t int or particular insular type of community. So it's not just the fishermen themselves, but their whole town more or less acts very similar because a fishing community is very different than other communities in any geographical area. It's a different type of place. Another example would be manufacturing workers. They're another different group, public sector union workers, etc. There's all sorts of them, and they're not all related to employment. I'm just throwing off the employment ones. A non-employment one you could say is uh, social conservatives, or you could say the progressive types, or Quebec nationalists. And across a country like Canada, you're going to have a lot of these groups. And how coalition forming works is you have someone like Pierre Poilievre, and he's going to try to win different of these identifiable groups and rally them to his cause. And then once they do that, their vote support goes up, and Poilievre gains voters. But the more you do this, the harder it is to keep doing it. Because there's other people to compete against. There's a reason why for the longest time the NDP has dominated union workers, or at least disproportionately dominated union workers. And that's not necessarily because the NDP was the best party for the unions, but they were the party that focused on the unions. So they were the most they're the first ones to talk about union issues, they're the first ones to stick up to unions for unions. They were the first guys to prioritize unions. And that was their thing. The conservatives and liberals could try to compete, but it's very difficult when the NDP are already competing really hard with that group. And this is, how, this is the same case across all identifiable groups. There's nothing saying the liberals can't compete for the Quebec nationalist vote. But the Bloc Québécois dominates the Quebec nationalist vote, so it's very difficult. And the more parties you have, the harder this is. That's why if you look at something like the Netherlands, where there is really no seat, there's no uh, seat threshold. So you can, as long as you can win a seat, you get a seat. You can have like 20, 30 parties. Because those parties are really oftentimes chasing after very niche identifiable groups. And that works out pretty well in the Netherlands. For the political parties, that is. Whether it works out well for the government is a whole other story altogether. But as a political campaigning standpoint, you get all these fragmentation. Because each group is going to create their own party, effectively. And we do sort of see that in Canada, but it's hidden. We don't have a red Tory party, a social conservative party, a blue Tory party. We have the conservative party. <clears throat> and we really saw this come play out in BC the last year. As I've touched on in the BC videos, I won't go into too much detail here. You can watch those videos if you want to watch, see that in more detail. But the gist is, Kevin Falcon got rid of John Rustad because he thought Rustad was a problem. But it turns out Rustad represented and spoke for a large enough fraction of the different members of the coalition that was the BC United Party. That this ended up being a coup. And now BC United is dead. And that's how it worked federally. Let's take back a step and look at 2021. Not the election, the aftermath of the election. At that point, the PPC was exploding. The PPC had already won some very specific identifiable groups. For example, Mennonites in Manitoba. Because the PPC was the party that was sp speaking most strongly for things like uh, vaccine choice. Or you could say being anti-vax, if you prefer. And that really spoke to Mennonites for various reasons. The community doesn't like being compelled to, do, to take vaccines for any reason at all. 
you can talk to Mennonite and get a better description than them. I'm not that familiar. I just know that that was a really big issue for Mennonites. So a lot of the Mennonites started voting for PPC in 2021. But then we see in the Portage Liscar by-election, a lot of these groups either were no longer voting, because prior to this, Mennonites didn't vote that much, or they switched back to the Conservatives. And the PC PPC vote share in Portage Liscar declined quite rapidly, quite sharply. Now, part of that, I think, is accurate to say is that the PPC running Bernier there, instead of another Mennonite, like Max Weeb, Webb, pronunciation, I apologize, uh, also likely hurt them. Because one of the things that matters when you're talking to trying to appeal to these different groups is actually running a candidate that is of that group. Now, this becomes really uncontroversial and obvious when we're talking about racial minorities, when you're talking about trying to win a very heavily East Asian seat like Richmond in BC, all the way down here, or parts of Brampton where there's South Asian or other areas, there's other ones. This also happened too back when there was Italians and Irish and all them. Parties would try to run someone of that ethnicity. And that's not just a pandering thing. It's because... For example, East Asians in Richmond are going to be from a similar cultural background, similar issues. They're living in a similar, uh, that community of very specific issues to their cultural group, their religious background, their needs. They're going to be looking more to someone who knows that. Now, as Patrick Brown shows, you don't strictly need to be from that group to represent them. But you have to own, earn the trust of that group. You have to be considered someone representative of that group for them to trust you. And that's not a given. And it's a lot easier to do that by just finding a candidate who is a prominent member of that community. If you look out east here in Halifax West, an area that I'm quite familiar with, one such identifiable group in Halifax West is the Lebanese Christian community. They make up a reasonably large portion of the population of Halifax West, and that they are an insular, coherent community. Which means they're going to vote more uniformly than you might otherwise expect. If you were looking at this as isolated atomic individuals, you would not expect uniform voting behavior. But because this is an insular, close community, when I say insular, I mean they're like isolated. I mean, they do a lot of inter-community things, right? They have like events and stuff. They go to each other's weddings and all that kind of stuff, right? <clears throat> and this is, again, this is true with every immigrant community. That's really obvious, but it's also true with just different local communities. You look at a small town anywhere, it's like this. So that community is itself a coherent block that you will try to win. You're not winning Joe Blow, the Lebanese guy. You're trying to win the, the support of the leadership of that community. Because if the leaders of such a community agree with your party, that community is likely going to break heavily in your favor. You're not going to win 100% of them but you might win a majority of them, or just disproportionate amount of them. And that's where a lot of actions have to be filtered through. I go back to this one all the time, because I'm from Nova Scotia, so this is a bigger... This matters more politically out east here. But Paul Yves' video back last March, March 2023, about changing the ceiling quota is such a campaign maneuver. The whole purpose of that was to try to win over the trust and concerns of fishing communities in Atlantic Canada. Now, he's not going to win every single person in the fishing community in Atlantic Canada, 
That's impossible. But this will mean this helps build in trust in these communities, that he's going to win more in these communities than he otherwise would have. Because he's giving them something, something really big, something they wanted. And this is how all of politics really ends up working. That's why, <clears throat> especially if you're a centrist type, this can seem really weird. Like, why is the Conservative Party pro-gun, low taxes, but protectionist? Small government, but hard on drugs? That might seem weird and incoherent, but these are speaking to different identifiable groups. And part of coalition building is you pick an issue that doesn't affect your other coalitions, but this per, or your other groups you're trying to win, but this other group really cares about it. You look at people in suburban Vancouver, they're very concerned about drugs. Speaking about drug issues to them helps. You look at rural farmers, being pro-gun is really helpful. They really like that. You look at your more upper class urbanite types, they like low taxes, etc. And that's how this coalition forms up. Now, ideologically speaking, you could say maybe it's coherent, but the goal isn't coherency in a big tent party. It's to find policies that benefit one group without alienating another group. And this is also why, for example, the liberals are big on spending. They are really strongly pro-abortion, strongly anti-gun. That they're very pro-immigration, but they're also kind of soft on crime. It's the same idea. They're trying to win different groups. And these policies don't offend the other groups they already win. In fact... Sometimes it might double dip. The urban progressive type likes immigration and likes abortion. So you double dip on them with those policies. And that's really how a lot of this works. Which is why you really abstract this to the highest level. Because again, all society's hierarchies, you can just keep tracing this down. It's fractal forever. But at the highest level, the right in Canada is composed of really three groups in the most abstract terms possible. You have socially conservative fiscal liberals, socially conservative fiscal conservatives, socially liberal fiscal conservatives. Those are the three groups that make up the Conservative Party. And the highest level. And it's roughly, I believe, 60% of the population is represented by those three groups. Yes, that means about 40% of Canada is fiscally liberal, socially liberal of some kind. At least according to 2021 data. That means the optimal position for a conservative in Canada is to be moderately fiscal and moderately social conservative. Not anything too crazy, but not anything too... But it has to be conservative. The reason for that <clears throat> is if you're moderately fiscally and socially conservative, your fiscal social conservatives are happy, obviously. The socially liberal fiscal conservative types really do usually care more about fiscal conservatism than social liberalism. So you can win them by appealing to their fiscal policy concerns. The fiscally liberal Social conservatives typically care more about social policy, so you can win them by appealing to their social concerns. And that's how the coalition building works. That's why you see Poilievre balancing this. That's why he, if you're a social conservative, you might be like, oh, why is he so slow about coming out on abortion or coming out on parental rights or whatever issue you want to say? And it's because he has to 
to check the room, if you will, on how far he can push it. Because he has to say something or he loses the social conservatives. But he can't say too much because then you might lose the social liberal or the fiscal conservatives. You have to balance that. That's the art of politics. That's the art of political power. You have different factions that will just leave. They will not vote for you. You might think of this as an extreme partisan type, because I know some of you watching this video are extreme, are very partisan, <laughs> and be confused. But doesn't the electoral math say that it's more optimal to vote for the somewhat better guy than the, so the worst guy doesn't win? Yeah, game theory says that. Voters are not always looking at the short-termist game theory of this election. They might be looking at the broader scheme of things. That if you reward a politician who doesn't do anything you want them to do, there's no reason why they're going to do that. They're ever going to do what you want them to do. And that's one of the reasons, to skip over to the U.S. momentarily, why some of Trump's decisions are uh, on a segment's vis a like abortion and stuff, are dangerous gambles. He's really gambling that he's alienated more fiscal conservative social liberals with uh, overturning Roe v. Wade than he's going to alienate social liberal fiscal conservatives by coming out as too pro-choice, if you will. <coughs> Apologies. I have a sore throat. You might have noticed. Anyways. And that's how all of this calculus works. So what does this bring us back to the original thesis of this video? Why is everything seem to slow down? Well, in 2021, when O'Toole was kicked or sorry, 2022, when O'Toole was kicked out of the party, was fired, was cooed, you could call it. The Conservative Party wasn't trying to contest the social liberal fiscal conservatives. Sorry, backwards. The social conservative fiscal liberals at all. And wasn't really trying to contest any particular part of the country. They're just doing the standard thing. Fualiev comes in, does his best to try to win social conservative fiscal liberal types, and has done his best to try to win uh, the fiscal liberal social conservative, sorry, fiscal conservative social liberal types at the same time. Things like promising to balance the budget and all that kind of stuff. And that goes quite well. It lets him gain a bunch of support. He managed to gut, say, the PPC. He managed to steal a bunch of support from the NDP. Some from the liberals. But you get rapidly to the point where in a quasi six-party system, he's now really batting his head against areas that are very entrenched. The PPC is now speaking to a very small percentage of the population who are very libertarian. It's very difficult for the conservatives to displace that. Ditto with the Greens. The Greens are speaking to a very solid percentage of the population who are very green. There's no other way to describe it. It's hard to displace that. The NDP these days are speaking to, like, a very specific type of union, public sectors, and a lot of urban, young, progressive types. Well, obviously the Conservatives aren't going to do very well among urban, young, progressive types. None of their policies appeal to them at all. Not even one. 
the bloc is appealing mostly to Quebec nationalists. And a little bit to the kind of Quebecer I'm going to call... Uh, not necessarily nationalist, but like the very decentralist Quebecer. Likes the idea of being in Canada, but wants as much autonomy as possible. Again, the nationalists are really hard for conservatives to beat, because what are you going to offer them that the bloc isn't already offering them? Not much. The decentralists, the conservatives can kind of compete on, which is why most of the swing seat, sorry, most of the seats the conservatives can gain in Quebec are from the bloc. Because the remaining group in Quebec are federalists who usually vote liberal. Those are like the three groups, the decentralists, the federalists, and the sovereigntists in Quebec. You could break that down into more, obviously, but those are the three big groups in Quebec. And then finally, who do liberals have? Well, the liberals have, again, young urban progressives, <coughs> older uh, retirees who want things to be stable and are concerned that quality is going to shake things up, people who require and need welfare and are concerned the conservatives are going to get rid of it, and they're concerned about that because the conservatives' promises to the fiscal conservatives scare them. And then you have a couple other groups too, but those the main groups really are urban progressives, retirees, and people who need welfare to maintain a reasonable quality of life. The poor, you could call them. Those groups are going to be hard for the conservatives to win. Now, at this stage, I would go so far as to say, I don't think we're going to see much more movement unless, say, the NDP collapses with the, un all, with the unions completely. Or the retirees get too concerned about Trudeau spending. Or something like that. There is also the possibility that natural population trends and ideological changes might shake up some things. But barring stuff like that, I think we're going to see the status quo continue. Because the conservatives have really hit the apex of groups they can win. Right now. And there's not really any other big issues they can hit on. That I can see. Though, perhaps the conservative war room has ideas that I do not have. I'm not privy to them, obviously. Well, that, I'll bid you do, and we'll see you next time with something different.